scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 8th chapter, verses 5 through 13, and I invite you to follow along with me now. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible distress. And he said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers underneath me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard him, he was amazed and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. To the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you according to your faith. And the servant was healed in that hour. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We continue this week in the Gospel of Matthew, hearing another healing narrative. This time in our narrative, we never meet the person who is healed in our story. We only know that he is a servant, which means he, in the ancient Mediterranean society, he is the ultimate nobody. We only know about this servant's need for healing because someone brings that need forward to the community. Because someone recognizes the need and decides to do something about it. We only know about this servant's need for healing because someone seeks Jesus out. And Jesus said, I will come and bring healing. That someone who brought this need forward is considered an outsider as well. He is a centurion, a soldier in the Roman army. He is part of the oppressive system which is defined as empire. Yet all that falls away in the face and the need of healing. All that falls away as we hear the plea of one man seeking healing for someone else who depends on him. All those boundaries and separations, outsider labels fall away in the face of relationship, in the face of community, not as individuals, but as whole as one body. Again this week, Matthew is inviting his readers to reimagine the kingdom of God, to realize that Jesus has the power to revision this family of God in which all the false boundaries that we put up fall away and can be overcome. Again, this week, Matthew is reminding us that in all his teachings, in all his interactions with people, Jesus never does what we expect him to do. You see, we assume, as we're reading this text, that because the servant is an outsider, because the centurion is an outsider, because one man is part of the empire and one is considered an ultimate nobody, we assume that Jesus will ignore their pleas for request and healing. After all, Jesus has said on multiple occasions in the Gospel of Matthew that he has come for the house of Israel first. Yet Matthew shows us that Jesus transforms our expectation, that in spite of our expectation, Jesus brings salvation to everyone, not just those who look like us, who think like us, who act like us. By healing this servant, by praising the centurion's faith, Jesus shows his disciples that in the kingdom of God, no one is left out, no one is ignored, no one is forgotten. This statement would have been very hard to hear for some of Matthew's original audience. 
This statement is still hard for some to hear, those who profess to be Christians, but they want boundaries around the church keeping us people out. Yet time and time again, Jesus shows us, tells his disciples that the kingdom of God does not play by our rules, that it does not ask our permission before it brings healing and wholeness for all of God's people. Time and time again, Jesus shows us, Jesus tells us, his disciples, that the kingdom of God does not seek our approval on who is in and who is out. The beauty of this story is that it gives us a glimpse into the kingdom of God, what it will look like here on earth when its promises are fulfilled. It is a vision when all people come together and enjoy each other and they feast at God's table. God gathers all in. God welcomes all to come to the table. God names and claims all as beloved children. For God longs for us to be together. God longs for us to be safe and whole. And God gives us, as communities of faith, as the body of Christ here on earth, God gives us the agency to help bring about this vision for all of God's children. Or let me say it this way. As we have said on multiple occasions, the year 2020 was a difficult year. From the pandemic to the sense of loss that is still lingering all over us like a cloud that just won't go away. Everything has shifted, everything has changed. This shift in narrative hit close to home for this community of faith last year. When we learned that our history is not and may not be what we thought it to be. In July of last year, it was brought to the attention of the leadership of this congregation about a connection between the destruction of Midway's Freeman School in 1867 and our community of faith. This was history that I was not aware of as the minister of Midway Christian Church. In all of our conversations about this community of faith and its history, from the organ incident, which eventually led to the separation of the Church of Christ and eventually the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, to the founding of the Kentucky Female Orphan School, I had never heard of this connection to the Midway's Freedmen School. In fact, in all my conversations and in about 15 years of living here in the Midway community, I had not heard of the Midway Freedmen's School. And I definitely had never heard of Midway Christian Church's connection to the destruction of that school. Here is what was shared with me. It's an excerpt from Dr. Bob Botkin's book, The Story of Midway University. In April of 1867, the Midway Black Church opened a school sponsored by the Freedmen's Bureau, operating in the log meeting house on the lower edge of the property owned by KFSO, OS, Kentucky Female Orphan School. With 46 pulpits pupils initially enrolled, the school had one teacher. Most of the students were children, but a handful were over 16. The school operated for a year without incident, but for whatever reason, in April 1868, the KFOS trustees appointed a a committee to notify, this is the quote in the text, the Negroes, to close the school they were running on KFOS property. The church leaders must have requested for more time in July 8th, The trustees, because the trustees instructed the committee to demand that the end of the present session, the congregation must close the school. Now, I want y'all to hear this part. The board of trustees consisted of the Christian church ministers and prominent laymen, the majority of whom held membership in Midway Christian Church. Did their demands grow out of concerns about potential violence on their property? or from their own racism. Perhaps it was some of both. 
Tragically, the committee did not have to carry out the order. On July 31st, in the dead of night, a mob shot out, shot out windows and wrecked the meeting house, wounding a few people in the melee. Not surprisingly, the Kentucky Superintendent's August report lists the Midway Colored School as closed. R. E. Johnston, the Woodford County agent of the Freedmen's Bureau, arrested and prepared to try some of the mob, but the county attorney refused to prosecute. Johnson, acting as an agent of the federal government, then proceeded to conduct a trial himself. Because of the darkness when the attack occurred and conflicting testimony, he had no choice but dismiss all charges. The trustees' minutes of August 12th do not acknowledge the scandalous calamity, nor do they dis demonstrate any signs of regret or sympathy. To the contrary, they determined to keep their special ad hoc committee intact to ensure compliance on the part of the former slave congregation. Remember, the Board of Trustees consisted of Christian church ministers and prominent laymen, the majority of whom held membership in Midway Christian Church. The first time I heard this information, it felt like I had been punched in the gut. This information shattered an idealized image that I'd had of this community of faith in our history, a community of faith which recognized the needs of the poor, which prided itself on being innovative in conversations of faith and relationship. This reading and information shattered my idolized image of a community of faith which tries to live out its mission of welcome in all things and through all things. The brokenness, which is a res direct result of this de destruction, still sits in our community of Midway. In fact, it continues to call me out as the minister of this community of faith every time I talk about reconciliation, calling me a hypocrite for not dealing with our own community of faith past of hatred and racism. The direct brokenness, which is a result of this destruction, destruction, holds me accountable every time I look upon my biracial daughter's face. Because it reminds me that wholeness cannot happen for the body of Christ as long as one part is hurting, as long as one part is ignored and forgotten. Healing cannot happen for the body of Christ until we proceed into the brokenness and invite something beautiful to come forth from that pain and sorrow. I do not know what this year holds for us as a community of faith, but I do know that as Midway Christian Church, as people of faith, as ones whose history includes the destruction of this school, we cannot talk about a season of recovery until we name this hurt, until we break down the false boundaries which continue to push people away. It is my hope, it is my prayer, that by knowing of this brokenness, we will renew our commitment for community connection and relationship, that we will start the process of healing by having the courage to have some very, very uncomfortable conversations about who we were in the past, who we are now, and how this holds us accountable to who we want to be in the future as a community of faith. It is my hope it is my prayer that we hold this vision of the kingdom of God, the one that Matthew brings to us, this vision coming to fruition here on earth where all are welcome, where all are embraced and seen as beloved children of God, where all are invited to come to the table and not be assimilated, but to come as individuals seen and welcome and embraced as beloved children of God. It is my hope and my prayer that in this season of recovery, that we as Midway Christian Church invite this vision of the kingdom of God to be our guide, 
reimagining the status quo as we experience the Spirit of God moving in and among us, bringing forth something so beautiful which was seemingly broken. May it be so. Amen.